I get so many questions in my DMs from y'all about commercial pet foods, whether it's what foods I'm feeding my dog, what foods I recommend, why I would feed this over that. But one question that I keep getting over and over and over in my DMs is about HPP food. So if you're not familiar with that, that's high pressure processing. And we have had many, many years of experts in the field telling us that it's just not what we want, that we don't want HPP foods, that you know, X, Y, and Z can go wrong. It's not really raw. It's putting, you know, leaching toxins into the food from the packaging that's being used, blah, 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 so many things. And this is not the first episode we have done on the Pet Parenting Reset about HPP foods. In fact, the last episode I did on HPP foods was telling you about how we were all wrong about it. And that came from today's guest. So Billy Hookman, if you're not familiar, I don't know how you wouldn't be, but just in case, he is the vice president of nutrition and communication at Green Juju. And he did a deep dive into HPP because he was one of those people long time ago thought that we did not want, like it was not preferable to use HPP as a kill step in creating raw foods for pets. But once he dug deep and looked at the science, all the research, checked out how it actually works, implemented it in green juju's freeze-dried raw diets, he saw that we were all wrong. The science is telling us that we were all wrong. So he's here today to explain and answer some of these very specific questions that y'all have sent to me on HPP processing and raw food commercial diets for our dogs and cats. So here we go. Thanks so much to Billy for being here. Uh, and we're going to talk all about it. Hopefully I get all of your questions answered, but at the end, Billy will let you know how you can reach out to him if you do have some more. Billy, thank you so much for joining me today. And this question I am getting multiple times a week in my DMs. So I figured, why not make a third podcast episode out of it? Because people obviously aren't getting enough of it. So we're going to talk about HPP, and I thought you were the perfect person to talk about it. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it is a funny, like, you know, it is kind of fun to talk about hot, hot button issues. Although this, I don't think this should be one. Um, and I, that's the interesting part, I think. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say, I, I'm, I'm rethinking it as well. I was one of those people that thought I listened to people that I really trusted. Um, other veterinarians who were like, no, you can't HPP the food. It's not really raw. And then you went and like shook everything up. <laughs> so can you tell me what HPP is? How does it work? Just give people a little bit of an understanding of what the heck it is we're talking about. Yeah, well, and the funny thing about that, what you're what you just said was I would gather I would I would uh, put a wager on the fact that most of those people you talk to probably got that information from me um, over the years because I was definitely one of the most outspoken people um, on the other side of this, which is truly is science is how you, you know, you look at data and you reach conclusions. If you ignore data, if you had a position that HPP is not good, um, and then you don't look at any new data in not in support of that point, then you're, you're not really doing anyone else favors. You're not practicing science. And so that's a, that's a very interesting starting point. So HPP is essentially uh, a process uh, using pressure for two, two outcomes. Um, the first outcome is in other industries. Um, so in other industries, they use it less to, um, for like safety because it's a raw product. So obviously they're not making like, you know, raw food chubs for humans. Um, so they're not using it on that safety aspect of it. They're using it more as a shelf life extender. So if you, so it's actually really interesting. I went to a, um, 
went to a HPP and freeze drying conference slash kind of workshop at the University of Nebraska, uh, a lot, like maybe six months ago. Um, and it was, you know, on within, within that conference. So we, we obviously learned a lot about it and we got to tour some facilities that do both freeze drying and HPP. There are, there are very few facilities that do both, um, in the same one. So that's pretty rare. Green Juju happens to be one of the companies that's produced in one that does have both, you know, in the same vein. So, uh, oh yeah. So, you know, in touring some of these facilities is really interesting because what you saw there was everything that we eat generally. Um, so you saw, you know, uh, guacamole, lunch meat, anything that's in plastic packaging and has an extended shelf life, especially like lunch meat or something like that. So like when I go to like my Whole Foods and buy, you know, my daughter, you know, pastured organic ham meat, lunch meat, that's going to be HPP to extend the shelf life. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a pressure of reducing pathogenic bacteria by, by a certain amount of logs or a certain amount of those bacteria reduction um, with pressure as opposed to heat. And so those are two different things. And I think people treat HPP like it's heat, but it's not, obviously. Um, and so it is interesting how they do it, you know, in the human food world, because they just put those packages straight in there. So let's say they're going to do coconut water. I'm just naming a random product. It's not like they're putting the coconut water in these, in a big thing and then doing it and repackaging it. They're actually putting it in the little bottles you get at the grocery store. And they're just filling the machine with those bottles. Um, and different industries have different varying amounts of pressure. Um, and so that's basically the process. It's, it's essentially one of the pathogen mitigating or reduction steps that a raw food company uses. It's just one of many, right? Um, another one would be keeping the product at, you know, 32 degrees or slightly less when you're mixing it together to, to reduce uh, the ability of, of pathogens to grow you know the other one might be spraying it with ozone these are things that all raw food companies do and this is just one of those processes which is why i sort of was you know i'm always surprised when people stick to that one and say this is the one i don't want versus what about all these other ones that are happening it's not as if when we make raw food and especially when it comes from where people want it to come from say the u you know usda meat all of and then when you go, so if you, like we use all USDA meat, right? And companies that are verifiable, say on Susan Thixton's list, use USDA meat. Um, so all of those places also have pathogen reduction steps. So, and then that meat gets to us and then there's more. So within that line of reduction steps, it's just one of, you know, I don't know, let's, let's just say like 10 or something like that. So. Um, It'll be interesting to see how the perception shifts over time. So a lot, a lot of companies use this, not just in pet food, but in human food. None of it's like, we don't know this. It's not on the label of these packages. So it's just happening a lot behind the scenes and we just don't realize it. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, I would say, you know, for sure. I would say the only people that probably label it as juice companies, um, you know, the difference between like fresh in-house um, or, uh, you know, I think like a good example that would be like Whole Foods. I think they went away from having it freshly made at the store and having it made at like a central facility that they have and then shipped out. And so you'll see it on there as well. Um, but yeah, pretty much, you know, now I guess people know, but you know, pretty much everything that, like I said, is in plastic packaging and refrigerated and has an extended shelf life, especially on the meat side, has been HPP for sure. So you talked about some of the other kill steps. What, how many are, do you, do you, do you want to talk about how many there are? All the different ways that companies, specifically raw pet food companies, are using different kill steps and should we care at all? Or is this something we should be talking about? Or are well, we just I mean, neurotic? We, 
we should care because it doesn't just come down to pets and what's safe or unsafe for pets. It does come down to the reg to regulation. It does come down to the FDA. It does come down to a lot of factors. And we want to be able to produce raw food. Um, the FDA is not going to mandate, uh, you know, never say never, but they're not going to mandate any production step because then they would be responsible for said step. So, you know, they, they adapt the policy of being like, you need a food safety plan, so you make it. And then we'll verify that, and then you're responsible for it if something goes wrong. So they're not going to do that. But um, in order to be sort of, you know, not continually harassed and and that and that kind of thing, um, you have to be doing some sort of log reduction step that is viable. And what I mean by viable is like a certain number of bacteria of the pathogenic bacteria are being reduced. So um everything else uh it, like i said it just depends on what your opinion of it is uh you know when you get chicken from the grocery store your organic chicken and it's dipped in parasitic acid is that a deal breaker for you or is it not you know is it is it benign is it not um that's all that's the usda you know standard for that um you know, spraying ozone is another one I feel like I consider to be benign. Benign, and then also um, some people use, say, bacteriophages, which are viruses that you know uh, target specific pathogen pathogenic bacteria. So for, with each one of those, you just kind of have to look at here's what the the good parts are, and here's what the no negative parts are. But I consider all of those to be pretty benign. Um, you know, in order to avoid that, you'd have to basically buy all of your meat from a local farmer that does all of his own, all of his or her own butchering. Um, and that's really the only way. Like, my family buys a pig every year in December, and that is going to, you know, that's that, that pig is raised by my cheesemaker and then uh, is butchered by my butter guy. And um, I know that that's, you know, just straight up old school, sort of like traditional butchering, um, but most people don't have access to that. And so um, the other part that's interesting, too, is HPP has been going on for so long in the industry, but just hasn't been talked about that there's been people who have been doing it and just not talking about it. And the interesting thing about that is, you know, you'll see comments online where you're like, oh, well, I go to this brand because they don't HPP, but then you figure out that like, you know, basically all the freeze dried in the country is HPP um, just generally. So it's like, wait a minute. So you thought your dog was doing great because it was non HPP, but it was HPP and your dog was doing great. So I think that, you know, there's, that's kind of like, you know, a nice little control group in a study uh, in essence. And, and, and so I think we're seeing the proof of that now. And it, it just, you know, it's one of those things. So there, there's no industry standard on what you have to do to mitigate the bacteria. Is that what I'm understanding? But is there yes. any sort of industry standard on the HPP process itself? Uh, no. So the HPP process will be different, uh, just like the freeze drying process is different, depending on if it's a human food, if it's, you know, uh, like here's a good example in freeze drying between human and pet food, you can freeze dry it at any. So there's, there's, there's always some added heat to freeze drying and that could be higher, lower. It can be, you know, whatever your freeze drying facility or if your freeze drying is willing to do. Um, so it's the same thing in, in HPP. So like when I went to that conference, they had liver out and they had differing levels of pressure and length. And then they had like the liver in bags and they could show you like the discoloration and or like what it looked like for differing amounts of time. So if you're doing HPP in the raw food industry like us and you want it to be raw, then, you know, on, on our end, we're doing it for less than two minutes. Um, yeah, it's, I believe offhand it's, 67k pressure which is um 
far as I know, lower than what they were doing, for instance, when they started doing HPP in terms of length and amount of pressure. Okay. So one of the reasons that um, was previously given for not wanting to use HPP in raw food was that it changed the nutrient, that it killed everything, not just the bad bacteria, but the good bacteria, blah, blah, blah. And that's not the case, correct? No, no. So the interesting thing about that is when somebody says like the phrase HPP just kills everything and they're not talking about specifics, it means they probably don't know very much about HPP or just nutrients in general. And what I mean by that is it's, it's good in those cases if you bring up specific instances. But the first thing to mention too is that, uh, you know, when people use that phrase and they say it kills the good bacteria, what good bacteria are they talking about in meat? There's no, there's no real probiotic bacteria in meat. Um, there's background flora, which may contribute to probiotics, or we don't know exactly what that is. So that's the first, I'm not even, I'm going to go into the second part and say that it doesn't kill those things. But even if it did, it's not like your dog is getting its probiotic source. You know, that's why, you know, Agri Juju, we do things like BAMS beets and, and the raw milk and things like that because it actually has probiotic bacteria. So you really just have background flora. So even if it did kill every all of the bacteria in it, you would be killing the bad bacteria and you're not taking any quote unquote good bacteria out of your dog's diet. But we do know that that's just simply not the case. And that comes from a study done by a product that was being developed for they basically what happens is it's it's a way to reduce bacteria by inoculation so it's a it's a probiotic blend um that you have to let sit on product for a certain amount of time and then it reduces the bacteria by as much as say hpp however the reason why it didn't work in raw pet food as a marketable thing for companies is because you'd have to literally let the food sit out for like two weeks and then let this bacteria grow, which the consumer is not willing to do, right? So, but before they figured this out, that it would only be good, I believe it's used in kibble now, before they figured that out, they took their blend, put it on food, HPP'd it, and what they found was that the bacteria were surviving um, that process. And so I'm not, I'm not here to say all bacteria survive, but all bacteria don't survive freezing. So we know that, you know, a reduction in bacteria is going to happen when you do any processing. Um, and so I think the first point is don't think you're getting your dog's good bacteria for meat anyway, but then also we do know that they do survive. And so, you know, I feel very confident when I feed Huckleberry and I'm feeding him his, um, his freeze dried HPP food and then also adding foods that contain a multitude of other good bacteria. He's not missing out on anything. Okay. See, that's why I have to ask you these questions. Um, <laughs> I had to bring it back to Huckleberry. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you have to talk about what's going on in your life, right? That's how we relate. So, some of the other questions that I've seen around HPP are um, changing the muscle fibers. And I guess some, some, some people have questions about, does it make it more or less digestible? Yeah. Can you so talk to either the digest Yeah, the digestibility one's really easy. It's the same digestible. Digestibility study labs are really easy. And Shout out to Steve's Real Food for doing a lot of, you know, the research in this, the relevant research, which is actual tests done on actual H raw HPP food, not, hey, we took this random study from the juice industry and we found this, which is great. You can, you can infer things that are uh, potentially relatable, but the, the most relevant data is going to be on the raw food side of, um, pet food. And so the digestibility is the same. 
Um, the muscle fiber thing is, I don't doubt that the muscle fibers could be um, uh, affected, but what is the overall effect? So let's say we determine that the muscle fibers are slightly affected. Okay, well, what is basically, and I was talking about this during a Q&A last week, you have to look at the pros and cons of every food that you feed. And you can find a con list for anything. So you could say, I like to feed my dog blueberries. Uh, blueberries are an amazing thing to feed your dog. However, there are cons on that list of things. And if you want to focus on those cons, you could put together a pretty strong list of reasons not to feed blueberries. And that's, that's the exercise we go through with everything we feed our dogs and cats is, hey, I, this, and, and for me, even in formulation and, and for, you know, bringing out new products, that's what you go through is like, I want to do this. Well, what are the cons and pros and cons? The only, the only food I don't think really has cons is raw milk. But aside from that, everything. And, and it goes back to depends on the specific animal as well. So I think that the, it affects everything in a, in a slight way. Um, but that doesn't mean it's overall something that's negative, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. What about um, fat oxidation? Does it increase fat oxidation? Only if the only studies that have found fat uh, fats oxidizing is if HBP is done for uh, 20 minutes or longer. And our HBP is done for less than two minutes. So the short answer is no. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a big one for me because I love fats. Um, I'm a huge proponent of, you know, it's healthy amounts of saturated fats and, and omega-3s and things like that in humans and dogs. So if I thought for any reason that, you know, the fats were oxidizing in our buffalo, I just called it buffalo, wow, bison food. <laughs> um, don't kill me, Water Buffalo Association. I've seen you at APCO meetings, and I know how uh, intense you are. So don't, uh, don't, don't uh, come after me. So we have a bison food, and um, not water buffalo, and um, I fed a taco, or I'm feeding a taco berry tonight. And if I thought for any reason that the omega threes in there were oxidized, I would not feed it. Okay. So the other thing that I keep hearing with this like high pressure is that there's a concern with toxins or microplastics leaching into the food during the process. Is there any validity the, to that? There's one study done on that, and that was, again, by Steve's Real Food, and they, they measured... Um, uh, did I have to look at their references on their website? I can't remember exactly which type of plastic, you know, uh, they were referencing on that, but um, they tested for that in the food itself and um, didn't find any accumulation after HGP. Um, so I would say it from what we know, and I never want to infer things for what we don't know, because I think that happens a lot in the pet food industry. I think people are doing that a lot with copper right now. I think they're inferring from things that we just don't know. Um, no. So there's. It, at least in pet food, there's one piece of data, and the answer is no. So, um, and that would depend too. Like, again, going back to the fat thing, right? Say the 20 minute. So, if fat, that study uh, comes from a different, um, be, uh, from a different industry. I can't, re I can't recall what the food was offhand, but. So you can see that there's different lengths of time in which they do this. So if you're saying, hey, plastic migrates into the food and it came from a study where they're doing something for 20 minutes, that's not relevant to what we're doing at, you know, less than two minutes. Um, it's sort of also like the heat processing of it as well. Um, that is actually my, the start of my journey, which was going to an HBP facility. And I was always under the impression that that much pressure generated heat and that heat would be like cooking the food. But then I went to an HPP facility and I was looking at the temperature 
while the machine was working. And it went from 41 degrees to 43 degrees. And so I was like, oh, I was wrong about that. What else am I wrong about? And that's the great thing when you realize you're wrong about something because you can learn. Um, I love, you know, the way that I, the way that I view nutrition now, as opposed to, let's say, you know, 15 years ago is completely, is completely different in a lot of ways. And so, you know, that just dispels another myth there that there's heat that's applied to it because of the HPP process, which just isn't true. There are some industries that apply both heat and HPP, but raw pet food's not one of them. Okay. So we know that pet parents can be very neurotic. So if they are still concerned with how their pet food, whatever they're buying for their pet is being processed, the kill steps they're using, especially if they are still concerned with HPP for some reason, what would be some of the questions you would pose to a pet food manufacturer if you were to call them up and ask them? about it. Um, I would just say, um, I would just say generally asking them for what are your manufacturing food safety steps and let them explain it to you. Um, because, you know, a lot of them, you know, a lot of pet food companies, us included, have manufacturing partners and that's not. And so some of these processes are going to be very similar or the same, depending on the facility it's produced in. And that information should not be hard to get necessarily. Uh, if they don't answer you back, that's not a good sign. If they, you know, um, and give them a little bit of time. I know from being in a, in a small company, you know, for instance, if you reach out right now to info at uh, greenjuju.com, it's me and Kelly that answer it, like, you know, every time so give us a little time because you know we're always doing a million things but usually we get back to you pretty quickly so but i would just ask them to lay out what their manufacturing safety steps are and then you can kind of go from there um and then you can go into um more specific questions but i would say like all of the HPP now is becoming more standardized in the pet food industry because they realize what pet parents want, which is a raw food product. Um, so they're not thinking to themselves like, oh, well, we can just do this to make sure for longer, you know, we want in. And I guess that's sort of speaking from more from the experience of the facility we work with. Um, but I'm sure it's not that far off or different at other facilities as well. So thank you, by the way, for um, answering all of those questions. And hopefully it can make some people sleep a little bit easier at night. I know like there were times in the past when I was very much like, no, I'm not buying that product because it's HPP'd. And I have bought products not thinking that about asking the question and then I don't know, maybe my brain was just like, oh, my dog didn't do that great on it. But she mm -hmm. loves the Green Juju products and she does really well on them. So maybe it's just a difference in like the time or like you were saying, there's, there, it's not really super standardized, but um, it, it could be also just be me. Too. It, it could be well, what? Well, it's definitely you. It's you it's for sure. It's always um, me. No, I, it could be a quality thing as well. Like, you know, all HPP products do not come with the same quality standard. And so, you know, I would put our products against anyone's. I think we, we make the best products in the industry, but um, uh, as far as quality goes. So I think animals just do better on our products because we put a lot of care and, and time and into the process. She does. My dog does do very well on the, on the products. Um, so I know that y'all have announced that you're going to be doing a frozen raw and that's mm -hmm. coming next year correct uh march yeah so march. We're, we're, we're working through that process right now it's a pretty easy process on my end because it's the same formula as the freeze-dried food so that's going to be really cool because we i think we did something special there um and and you know kelly's hard at work on the uh packaging and you know the back end of that and working with the facility and and that kind of stuff 
but I'm excited about it because the price point is really good, uh, in my opinion, and we don't ever want that to be, you know, a huge barrier. And we can finally get big, big dogs involved. I know you don't have a big dog, but um, it's very hard for big dogs to be on freeze dried diets completely. Um, I get <laughs> emails about, you know, my 80 pound dog, how much food, and I'm like, and by the way, we're releasing Frozen in March. You know, is yeah. my is my is my typical response because. It's a bit difficult, but also I know there's just a preference for frozen food because it's one less production step. I know freeze drying is another one where people are like, well, that's not raw food. Well, it's like, well, the thing is, if you make a freeze dried formula versus a frozen formula, you don't have to reformulate it at all because you don't, the nutrient profile is exactly the same. So we know that's raw food, but also we do know, I know that, you know, for myself, I know there's value in you know, reducing production steps, just in general, like um, at home, for instance, you know, I, green juju is an amazing milk that's available for people all around the country because they can't get raw milk just generally. But that might, but that also means that I might feed my dog fresh milk because I live in Pennsylvania and it's never been frozen. And, you know, I'm in the land of raw milk. So I do think there's value in, you know, reducing your production steps and and eating that way but um the frozen is going to be really cool i think so yeah i'm excited about it i think a lot of other people are as well and i the the processing steps you were talking about i recently learned um every processing step increases histamine in the foods is what i've been told interesting oh that's a, i've never Interesting. Well, you've sparked something in me uh, to, I'm making a mental note of that. And um, <laughs> yeah, and... well, the, my, so my, that mentor told me and because yeah. she's been through this journey herself and um, yeah, it actually has made a big difference in some of my clients, dogs who didn't want to feed their dogs a raw food diet, but eventually when they just couldn't get over the hurdles they were looking to get over I'm like let's try raw and they did it and they're like oh my gosh just because we needed to reduce the histamine load and it's been really really incredible so interesting yeah I mean I would say like I probably have uh, a different uh, I would say I have a, like a little bit of a different take on histamines than most people in the industry in regard to like I think that most people and dogs their body as a system for just you know eliminating excess histamines i i.e like those foods shouldn't be a problem that's not to say mm -hmm. that they're not some dogs who are potentially very yeah. sensitive to that or people but these are, these are the sick dogs <laughs> yeah the, the idea that like you know i hear a lot like oh don't feed fermented foods because they're high in histamines well mm -hmm. yes uh, and no, not all fermented foods are high in histamines. It depends on how they were fermented, and, and there's a lot that goes into it. But, you know, I think what can happen online is that you get an, a theoretical idea like that, and you apply it to all dogs, when mm -hmm. most dogs in humans would benefit highly from fermented foods and would be able to mm -hmm. easily deal with any sort of histamines that come into play. You know, it's like when you see mm -hmm. someone drink a glass of wine and their face gets all red that is really high in histamines and and that's a different kind of you know high in histamines and so um but that's interesting yeah so for those people that you know want are looking for frozen um and i i should mention the only one we're not going to have is bison because we kind of are maxing out our sourcing on mm -hmm. that already we use more bison than probably most than any other company i would guess um at least you know in the indie pet scene um but we will have five other very novel proteins that range from cooling to warming so i think that will be fine okay well thank you so much again for answering all of all of the questions that have been sent to me on um hpp foods and um very excited about what green juju has coming uh, if somebody did have more questions, I think you said it earlier, info at greenjuju.com. Yep. 
And like I said, if it's a nutrition question, it will go right to me. Or if it's something that's Kelly related, it'll go to her. Or, you know, we do have a little bit, you know, we do have a little bit bigger of a team now. Uh, we just hired someone. And so it'll go to the appropriate person. Um, but I, I do enjoy nutrition questions. So um, feel free to reach out. Send them. Okay. Anything else you want to plug for Green Juju before I let you go? Uh, yeah, we do have... Um, in November, we have a venison broth coming out, um, which we will be. Um, it's funny because me and Kelly always do a live whenever we uh, release new products. We did a live about our the products I'm going to talk about in a second. We we will be doing a live about the venison broth. It is frozen. It is wild harvested venison, um, which is really cool. Um, and then we're also releasing goat freeze dried food, lamb freeze dried food that we debuted at super zoo and also um goat purple and those are amazing amazingly sourced grass-fed great omega-3 ratio products and so um really excited about that um and excited for you know in those cases like it's always like huckleberry's been eating goat for a long time and it's fun that when it actually goes out to the public so look for those as well um and i think that's about it did you feed it to him through the summer? Goat? Um, uh, not a bunch. Uh, more recently, actually, because I got a bag of... <laughs> so we actually changed the formula slightly. It was going to have dandelion greens, but now we use parsley um, as the leafy green um, because we wanted the sort of medicinal effects of parsley with, you know, what we're looking for in formulation, like the vitamin K1 and fiber and things like that. So we had like a run of this like dandelion green goat and we sent it out to our employees, but we all got a bag like it was like a 14 pound bag. No. Yeah. Of freeze dried food. So it's huge bag. So I've been feeding that and giving it to some people and, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but I'm a variety person as well. So. Okay. Well, uh, Billy, thank you so much for being here and for answering all of my questions, even though you had no idea what they were ahead of time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Anytime. Oh!